This week, we welcome Matt Cawthorn and Juan Canales for an honest conversation about response. In the leadership and communication sections, profile of the post-pandemic CISO, time to rethink business continuity and cybersecurity, protecting remote workers, productivity and performance, and more. Business Security Weekly starts now. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we explore the business of security to improve the security of business. Your trusted source for actionable insights on leadership, communication, and innovation. Get ready for Business Security Week. Most breaches are caused by exploiting oversights and basic cybersecurity fundamentals. But complex, hybrid, multi-cloud infrastructures make cybersecurity hygiene challenging. Red Seal can help. It shows you what's on your network, how it's connected, and the associated risk across public cloud, private cloud, and physical environments. With Red Seal, you'll get control of your cybersecurity fundamentals so you can protect your organization from the inevitable attack vectors and reduce your cyber risk. For more information, visit securityweekly.com forward slash Red Seal. Welcome to Business Security Weekly. This is episode number 179, recorded July 6, 2020. Hope everyone had a safe and happy July 4th weekend. I am your host, Matt Alderman, here in Colorado. Joining me from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island is my co-host, Mr. Paul Asadorian. Hey, thanks, Matt. It's good to be here. And we have Jason Albuquerque on the lines remotely back this week after a week out. Great to be back, Matt. Yeah, one of these days we all have to get into studio. I don't know when, but we just got to figure it out. We're going to work on it. (laughs) We are looking for high quality guest suggestions for all of our podcasts to fill our Q3 recording schedule. Submit your suggestions for guests by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash guests and completing the form. We just reviewed them last week, but every couple weeks we review them, approve them, and then Sam will reach out to schedule something to get you on the podcast. Also, with all the recent changes to Black Hat and DEF CON, we realize we can keep doing what we do best, host virtual podcasts. I'm proud to announce Hacker Summer Camp 2020, a Security Weekly virtual live stream event, August 3rd to August 6th, 2020. To reserve your slot now, visit securityweekly.com forward slash summer camp 2020. Matt Cawthorn is no stranger to the show. He is responsible for all security implementations and leads a team of technical security engineers who work directly with customers and prospects. Matt is often on-site with customers working to solve the complex and mission-critical business problems that Fortune 1000 and Global 2000 companies face. And speaking of customers, Juan Canales is a senior manager of enterprise security and architecture at a private health organization where he designed the data centers and IT cloud strategy. He is uh, a leading security professional with more than 20 years of experience in computer, network, and information security. He has worked in high-tech, manufacturing, financial, and healthcare verticals. Matt and Juan, welcome to Business Security Weekly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yes. Well, we always love a customer perspective, Juan. When, you know, when we get the opportunity to do this. It's great because you really bring insights into some of the challenges you're facing uh, in your organization. I think it it just really helps people understand some of those challenges and and how to solve them. We're going to talk response today. And what does response mean? You know, in in the way I kind of summarize this, right, when we look at the NIST cybersecurity framework, there's identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover. But the way people talk about response uh, can vary in different disciplines in security. Uh, For some people, it's automated remediation, and for others, it's it's human manual incident response. Um, And so let's start a little bit talking about some of the challenges with what does response mean? Sure, yeah. Um, Well, for me, response really depends on the type of event because uh, it really starts there. We can all have uh, something happen in the network, and we could react to that event. And in some cases, we could uh, send an email. In some cases, it could be correlate with other logs, right? And so response could be defined by an action according to an event that happened, 
right? Now, what type of uh, or what additional actions do you perform uh, could become your response? And so that's, that's the way I see it is it really depends on the type of event that happens. Yeah, and when we think about some of the the um, kind of technology kind of security areas, we think about endpoint detection response for a second, right? One of the examples we throw out in the description, and a lot of that has to do with what can the endpoint do to automatically respond to events that it's seen. But that's not the end of response either, even though maybe a tool took an automated action, there's still more to response than just that tool automation component, isn't there? Yeah, that is correct. Uh, today, we look at reports or we look at an event that got raised in, in the system. And one of the things that commonly happens is that there has to be some interpretation on what do we do next. And part of that requires human intervention. So in my case, I, I do a lot of automation and I use a lot of different security tools. One example is XROP and Splunk. Those are key tools that uh, security professionals use. And what I find myself doing is that we need to correlate all the information as much as possible and put together uh, a timeline of what ha what happened. And the the automation tool will only get you so far. So you still need someone to look at uh, the event and determine what is the um, what's it called the impact of of that event. Did it really impact just one user, or did it impact the entire organization? And that's how I determine whether we need to elevate this event to an incident. And that incident also requires us to uh, summarize it into a, a, uh, a final report. And the tool, whether you can automate what to do with an, an actual event, does not get you to the point where you need to create a summary that needs to be delivered to the executive team. Right. And, and Matt, when I think about events and escalating them to incidents and extra hop, right, he talked about some of that correlation between extra hop and Splunk, for example, from, from a sim perspective. You know, how, how does that kind of also translate and correlate with, with what you guys are doing in, in extra hop as well? Yeah, I mean, it, first of all, that distinction is a really interesting one to make the difference between a discrete event and an incident. And it's worth thinking about for everyone's practice, how 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 you draw those lines. And then what data sources do you use? This is a very sort of common drum that I myself beat and, uh, and at ExtraHop we beat is, you know, you really do want multiple sources of data to inform your decisions and your assessment to help adjudicate an incident or an event, as well as to respond to it and recover. So Splunk is a wonderful example of a SIM sort of log-based data source, and everyone should be doing that. Then there's the network component, and lastly, it would be an EDR, some sort of endpoint. And between those three things, what you'll find is they give you, I, I really believe in Pareto's law, and so it gives you sort of for 20% of the investment in tooling, it gives you 80 plus percent of your coverage from a security perspective. And so thinking about your practice and from a, from a detection perspective as well as an IR um, perspective, Thinking about your practice along the boundaries of these data sources will really, really help because we, we complement each other in various ways. And we all have our own constraints and our own limitations, and we're very, very complementary when you're using them in the way that, that Juan is using us, which is in sort of concert to help inform your decisions with data. So you identified three of Paul's four quadrants. Mm -hmm. He forgot threat intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, that also plays a very important set of data into this response discussion as well, doesn't it? It does. Yep. I totally agree. Threat intel, you would you could easily count that as a fourth. Yep. Right. Right. But my my and question I is, have a, oh, sorry, go ahead, Juan. Oh, I, I was going to say that I have an example of where you need to uh, do some intelligence 
and see whether you do this an event is actually an incident. Uh, one example is on my extra tool, we got an alert, uh, a developer triggered an exfiltration event after further analysis and correlation with all the tools, we determined that the event was uh, triggered because the developer was querying a database and at the same time streaming a YouTube video in high definition. So that combination caused uh, like a false positive. It, it was the developer triggering a, a query on sensitive data but at the same time, it was masked with YouTube uh, networks, uh, network network packets. And so we were able to determine that that incident or that event not, did not need to be escalated to an incident. It's an interesting use case, you know, with people now, you know, working remotely, you could see a lot of streaming potential activities while they're also multitasking, doing something else, which together correlated could be uh sure. classified as an event yeah, yeah and that can be job related too I, I don't know why people have gotten away from actually writing posts and just posting videos instead but you know i was configuring some security software and the documentation the best source i could find was a video so i had that yeah. video going like while i was on the <laughs> command like like trying to you know fast forward and, and follow along so right yeah it's interesting what so so one that particular use case just to just to walk that through and land it back on incident response, you know, from from a developer's perspective, we would see that developer system connecting to a, a critical asset, which would be a database, running queries, which could be correlated with staging, and then the subsequent exfil out the front end via SSL, right? And so those behaviors taken together and given context look suspicious. But to your point, when you're making that distinction you need the investigative support behind the event, right? And so you were able to validate right. through whichever tools, you were able to validate the, the behaviors in concert with one another and in the context of one another right. and realize that you didn't need to escalate or turn it into an incident. That's correct. really cool. Yeah, yeah correct. Yeah. And then, yeah, and I mean, that, that level that, of visibility the... is, is getting more and more important these days, right? I mean, with folks, with folks working from home, um, you know, I'm at least within my organization starting to see a lot of that hybrid use of corporate assets, right? Where, you know, folks folks are literally working more than they ever had when they were working in the office. Now they're now they're leveraging our assets to do some personal things. So be able to correlate that back and, and, and have the right information that could determine, you know, the line between an event and an incident is huge, right? Because you could have without right. the right information, you could have flipped that into an incident right away. Hundred percent. Yeah. And then I, I can also add the human uh, aspect to this because I called up the developer and I had all my evidence uh, in front of me with the tools. And after further discussion with the, with the developer, the developer said that the reason why he was playing YouTube video while querying the database was because he did not want to show his manager idle time. He wanted mm -hmm. to keep something that kept the desktop on all the time. Right. <laughs> so those are the kind of things that you uh, get to experience right now when people are working from home. Yeah. Yeah. You know, to, to your point, some of the biggest struggles that we're, we're hearing feedback from our customers is the ability to measure productivity while folks are working from home. Um, you know, because because having a remote workforce for some leaders is, is you know, uncharted territory or uncomfortable. And I'm hearing more and more from customers how. How do you see, you know, productivity? And and I know I've actually seen some some security companies start to make that flip into a traditional sim to starting to have modules where you can see productivity usage for down to the individual level, right? So productivity is is starting to become a hot topic these days with with so much work from home. You know, I think you just not need to, a really I'm not, gonna turn, I'm not gonna turn this into a feature discussion, but for exactly these reasons. We just added VPN stitching to our most recent release because now on the front end and the back end of a VPN endpoint or concentrator, we're able to correlate the far side of that connection with internal asset behaviors. And it turns out yeah. to be very, very useful for exactly those reasons. The lines are really getting blurred as to where the 
the sort of edge starts and stops at this point. Big time, big time. Yeah, right. I'm seeing a lot of that conversation. And, and the, the funny part is they're coming to the security team to see if we have tools and insight to yep. offer up productivity, you know, productivity analytics right. and data. So it, it's kind of it's kind of funny that, you know, for something that would be more of a, 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 a business type level analytics, they're coming to the security team because they know we have visibility down to the endpoints now. That is correct. And but now, one of the things now, that... Go ahead, Juan. I was going to say, one of the things that my security team have been doing to help with the incident response is trying to see if the tool can collect information as much as possible so that we can determine or, or make a verdict on whether something requires some additional attention. Maybe it needs to be approved by the CIO before we continue the investigation. Uh, that is... Uh, something that has happened in the past. One example is we recently got uh, an email sent to us that was a fish, uh, a phishing attempt, but that attempt, it wasn't malicious the first time. It turned malicious after a couple of hours. Those are the, the new types of uh, threats that we're faced with uh, in, in today. And the tool was able to uh, detonate the email, go through a sandbox um, process, and then flag that email as malicious, and then the automation automatically quarantined everything. But what the, the automation tool didn't do is summarize what was the impact. And that's where the team comes in and then uh, complements the tool and grabs all that information, not only from the tool that took action, but also from the other tools in the network, such as ExtraHop and Splunk. Right. As you think about root cause analysis and what other protection mechanisms I need to put in place, that's still a human part of the response process that you can't automate all of those pieces. Right. Right. Yeah. The and in of, most Sorry, Juan. I was just going to say one of the one of the outputs of an incident response exercise, Matt, to your point exactly, can be and probably should be an assessment back into your security controls. So you end up enforcing your detection strategy better, assessing your controls in the first place, or maybe even identifying new controls that you can put in place. Yeah, that's okay. precisely what my team uh, does is after an incident happens, we go back and we look at what can we improve. And in most cases, what we're doing uh, as a top uh, task is stitching the data or figuring out a way to pass uh, identifiers between tools. So we're not passing everything that the tool detected because that's what the tool is for. But what we could do is we could create unique IDs or identifiers that we can then use to stitch the information between tool to tool. And that gives us the clear picture of what's going on, what, what happened, who was impacted, and whether we need to escalate this further. Uh, our, our main issue that we are faced with is also uh, making the determination of should I inform the executive team that an incident has happened. And, and so for that, that's another hour discussion on policies and procedures, but it does uh, need to be addressed that we need to augment our security controls to address that. Definitely. There, there's a very live discussion on, on the Discord channel around Jason's point of monitoring yeah. employees. And I was thinking, I'm like, this is a perfect use case for a bot, right? I, somebody's going to deploy a bot at home that is constantly communicating to show that it's connected busy so it looks like they're productive. And I'm wondering, right, how, right. Do you, how do you start to detect and, and validate whether that's a valid incident or not? Yeah, yeah, right, right. I mean, yeah. you know, the, yeah. the, the, product, the productivity side is, is real, right? Again, you know, executives have this gap in this, this fear because they're not used to such a large remote workforce. And, you know, I would argue that maybe, you know, the, those executives don't quite have performance metrics um, tuned in as much as they should 
So now they're relying on connection times to things, right? So, so you know, conversations that I'm having with executives on leveraging security tools to measure productivity is about, all right, well, what is considered productive, right? I mean, some, some uh, portions of the workforce, LinkedIn is considered productive because they're doing inside sales or pre-sales. Right. But in other parts of the organization, right. that may not be productive, right? Right. There is another incident that uh, I can share with you is the it happened many years ago early start when i started to use extra hop and it was um, dealing with performance as well but this one's a little bit different than the first experience that i share with you on this one a user was out outperforming everyone in the organization and we wanted to find out why that was why was this person a rock star and after further investigation Again, the tool gave us so much. We needed human interaction. Uh, but at the end, what we found out was that this user was sharing their account with other individuals and then asking them to help them um, finish their work. And so we were able to detect that <laughs> by means of anomaly detection. How often was this person logging in, where they were logging in from, what devices they were logging in from, we were able to correlate that, um, but it, it, it took a bit of exercise in a team of, of security analysts to, to look at that information and determine that it was this person that was sharing their account with other people to be able to complete their work uh, or outshine, you know, everybody else. <laughs> you know, for me, my, and it's a very sort of stock answer, to be fair, but the people that are slacking off at home are going to be the same ones who find ways to slack off in the office. I That's agree, just Matt. The way it works. I agree wholeheartedly with that. Yeah. 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 Juan, I, I wanted to ask you um, in the uh, incident response process, uh, I've found and have experienced that the organizations that are better at that have developed close relationships across all of the functional business units to be part of that whether the security incident is, you know, employee focused because, you know, someone's not doing their job or doing something they're not supposed to, whether it's a nation state threat and everything else in between, it requires collaboration with those other groups within the organization. How have you worked to build relationships with those other groups? In, in the security programs that I've helped develop, they take years um, to, to develop or, um, like mature. And one of the things that tends to be the first thing that you put in place is vulnerability management. And when we work with the organization and individuals on what are the weaknesses that their systems have, that's where we start to develop these relationships. We start to educate them on what are some of the risks and the potential of a breach. And as they help uh, the the team to address some of these uh, weaknesses in their systems, that's when we start to get into the incident response. If if an event did occur and it was raised to an incident, uh, we would like you to participate in trying to remediate that as soon as possible. And uh, it has been successful, but it does require us uh, in the security space to educate everyone in terms of what the risk is. Uh, a lot of folks think that risks are something that the security team makes up. But when you show them real examples of what has happened in other organizations, then they become open to it and they're, they're part of that team. I, so yeah, and like I, well, I think, Juan, the, uh, what I took from that first and foremost was it takes time to build those relationships, right? It's not just fl yeah. flipping a light switch, right? Mm -hmm. And Paul, you know, it also takes the business unit to have skin in the game. Yeah. Right. Agreed. So, so between the two, mm -hmm. um, now you're, now you're building a level of trust and reliance on each other and partnership and collaboration across the business. Well, guys, I mean, I'll, I'll take it maybe a step further. And I've said this before in different forums, but coordination cost as a thing is something, it's a devastating cost and it represents very material risk and nobody talks about it in IT. And we really, really need to start talking about just the cost of coordination and how to 
to streamline coordinate coordination across these these operational groups if you just to get technical for a minute if you think about the osi model right it's the sort of really well-defined, generally speaking, this well-defined contract of how apps and services are delivered to consumers on a wire. Those protocols are very well established. But then if you flip that model on its side and blow it out horizontally, you have operational groups like the database team or the security team or the network team, and the coordination is broken. And so we're, our organizations from their structures are not nearly as streamlined as the app services and the stacks that we deliver. And so to the extent that you can use data and a common practice and coordinate from it, especially with the leadership um, sponsor, I totally agree with that. Um, you can start to minimize coordination cost and the associated risk. We definitely have a few articles actually that's gonna hit on some of these points that we've highlighted today, because I, when we think about resiliency, we think about response and in the recovery side of of an incident and a breach there's a lot of coordination that needs to happen we got to get those systems back up from an availability perspective we're going to get into some interesting article discussions but again we can't automate all these pieces there there is a human element here that we have to continue to think about and juan what i think has been encouraging is some of the examples you shared on where do you spend that human capital? Because it's so precious. It's and limited I, in an organization. I like Matt's analogy to the OSI model because it means I could tell my UDP joke, except you might not get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Had to slip it in, huh? <laughs> I, can't not. Not. I was waiting for that one. Great opportunity. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> Uh, Jason, Paul, any other questions while we have Juan and Matt with us? Uh, good to yeah, go on my good, side. Yeah. Awesome. Matt, Juan, thank you so much for joining us on Business Security Weekly. Wonderful to be here. I Thanks, appreciate guys. it. Thanks, guys. Thank you, guys. Appreciate thank it. You. If anyone wants to learn more about ExtraHop, please visit securityweekly.com forward slash ExtraHop. We'll take a quick break and then cover the leadership and communications articles for this week. <laughs> <laughs> 